Hello everyone, uh, welcome back. So, for the second story that I thought I would read, I have chosen uh, an M.R. James classic, A Warning to the Curious. M.R. James was, uh, was another very prolific writer of ghost stories, supernatural mystery type things. Uh, he did um, the Ash Tree, the Stalls of Barchester Cathedral, the Rose Garden. He did uh, quite a few, and uh, mo a lot of them are available online if you enjoy this and you'd uh, like to see some more of his work. And the good thing about uh, M.R. James's work is that I believe in the 70s, the BBC did do uh, versions of these stories for TV, and they are narrated by Christopher Lee. So if that sounds uh, appealing to you, and I, I've seen them, they are pretty good, so I do recommend them. They actually used to be on, uh, they might still be, I haven't checked, uh, on YouTube. So if you um, would like to see them, they are out there. I recommend them. They're, they're pretty good. Now, although A Warning to the Curious came out in the 1920s, which means it's not quite Victorian. Uh, I am still going to do uh, a warning that this text may include things that um, you basically, again, the same sort of ugly attitudes towards things like race, gender, religion, orientation, issues around mental health. Although it's it's not Victorian, as I said, it was done in the 20s. Generally speaking, anything you can ping the Victorians for, you can usually ping the very early 20th century for as well. So like I said, like last time, um, I don't remember there being a lot of that in this particular text, but it might be there. So just forewarning all of you. And uh, the only other things are, once again, the cat might put in an appearance. He didn't last time. He was a good boy. He sort of stayed off to the side, uh, out of the way, but he might put in an appearance. Also, I'm going to be reading this and probably chipping in with some of my own comments. So if that's not something that appeals to you, there's definitely other people out there who have read this story and kept it comment free. So if that's not something you're interested in, feel free to, to find someone else reading it or to read the text yourself. It's also, it's also a perfectly fine thing to do. You won't offend me. Also, I have had a request for the next story that I read, so I will be honoring that request that I had from a friend. And if anybody else has a suggestion or a request for something they'd like me to read, feel free to just leave it in the comments. So here we go, A Warning to the Curious by M. R. James. Yes, the silly straw has returned as well. The place on the east coast which the reader is asked to consider is Seaburg. I want to say that is Seaburg. Maybe it's Seaburr, I'm not sure. Uh, side note, I have trouble taking this name seriously because of its resemblance to Duckburg, although I recognize that's not James's fault. That one's, that one's on me. Nonetheless, uh, Seaburg does remind me of Duckburg. It is not very different now from what I remember it to have been when I was a child. Marshes intersected by dikes to the south, recalling the early chapters of Great Expectations. Fun little reference to uh, another text there. Flat fields to the north merging into heath, heath, fir woods, and above all, gorse inland. A long sea front and a street, behind that a spacious church of flint with a broad, solid western tower and a peal of six bells. I don't know where six bells ranks in the sort of church bell scale. Let's assume six bells is pretty pimpin'. How well I remember their sound on a hot Sunday in August, as our party went slowly up the white, dusty slope of road towards them, for the church stands at the top of a short, steep incline. They rang with a flat, clacking sort of sound on those hot days, but when the air was softer, they were mellower too. The railway ran down to its little terminus farther along the same road. There was a gay white windmill just before you came to the station, and another down near the single shingle at the south end of town. So 
mispronouncing things already, I do apologize, and yet others on higher ground to the north. There were cottages of bright red brick with slate roofs. But why do I encumber you with all these commonplace details? You're the one telling the story, dude, so uh, that, one's, that one's up to you. The fact is that they come crowding to the point of the pencil when it begins to write of Seaburg. I should like to be sure that I ha had allowed the right ones to get on to the paper. But I forgot. I have not quite done with the word painting business yet. Walk away from the sea in the town, past the station, and turn up the road on the right. It is a sandy road, parallel with the railway, and if you follow it, it climbs to somewhat higher ground. On your left, you are now going northward, is heath. On your right, the side towards the sea, is a belt of old firs, wind-beaten, thick at the top, with the slope that old seaside trees had, seen on the skyline from the train, they would tell you in an instant, if you did not know it, that you were approaching a windy coast. Well, at the top of my little hill, a line of these firs strikes out and runs towards the sea, for there is a ridge that goes that way, and the ridge ends in a rather well-defined mound commanding the level fields of rough grass, and a little knot of fir trees crowns it. And here you may sit on a hot spring day, very well content to look at blue sea, white mill windmills, red cottages, bright green grass, church tower, and distant Martello Tower to the south. Quite an idyllic country scene there. As I have said, I began to know Seaburg as a child. But a gap of a good many years separates my early knowledge from that which is more recent. Still, it keeps its place in my affections, and any tales of it that I pick up have an interest for me. One such tale is this. It came to me in a place very remote from Seaburg, and quite accidentally, from a man whom I had been able to oblige enough, in his opinion, to justify his making me his confidant to this extent. I know all that country more or less, he said. I used to go to Seaburg pretty regularly for golf in the spring. I generally put up at the Bear with a friend. Henry Long it was. You knew him, perhaps. Slightly, I said and we used to take a sitting room and be very happy there. Since he died, I haven't cared to go there, and I don't know that I should anyhow after the particular thing that happened on our last visit. It was in April, 19 blank. We were there, and by some chance, we were almost the only people in the hotel. So the ordinary public rooms were practically empty, and we, <coughs> excuse me, and we were the more surprised when, after dinner, our sitting-room door opened, and a young man put his head in. We were aware of this young man. He was a rather rabbity, anemic subject, light hair and light eyes, but not unpleasing. It's kind of an odd description. I can't decide if that description is an insult or not. Rabbity and slightly anemic. Certainly paints a picture, if nothing else. So when he said, I beg your pardon, is this a private room? We did not growl and say, yes, it is, but Long said, or I did, no matter which, please come in. Oh, may I, he said, and seemed relieved. Of course, it was obvious that he wanted company, and as he was a reasonable kind of person, not the sort to bestow his whole life history on you, we urged him to make himself at home. So I'm with them on this. If you're one of these people where you're introduced to someone, you just meet them, you then unload on them a shotgun blast of personal, too much personal information, no one likes you, and you should stop. <clears throat> I dare say you find the other rooms rather bleak, I said. Yes, he did. But it was really too good of us, and so on. That being got over, he made some pretense of reading a book. Long was playing Patience, which I think is a card game. I was writing. It became plain to me after a few minutes that this visitor of ours was in rather a state of fidgets or nerves, which communicated itself to me, and so I put away my writing and turned to engaging him in talk. After some remarks, which I forget, he became rather confidential. You'll think it very odd of me, this was the sort of way he began, but the fact is I've had something of a shock. Well, I recommended a drink of some cheering kind. So do I, James. So do I. And we had it. 
The waiter coming in made an interruption, and I thought our young man seemed very jumpy when the door opened, but after a while he got back to his woes again. There was nobody he knew in the place, and he did happen to know, <clears throat> to know who we both were. It turned out there was a common acquaintance in town. And really he did want a word of advice if we didn't mind. Of course we both said, by all means, or not at all, and Long put away his card. So there you go, patience is a card game. And we settled down to hear what his difficulty was. It began, he said, more than a week ago, when I bicycled over to Froston, only about five or six miles to see the church. I'm very much interested in architecture, and it's got one of those pretty porches with niches and shields. I took a photograph of it, and then an old man who was tidying up in the churchyard came and asked me if I'd care to look into the church. I said yes, and he produced a key and let me in. There wasn't much inside, but I told him it was a nice little church, and he kept it very clean. But, I said, the porch is the best part of it. We were just outside the porch then, and he said, Ah, yes, that is a nice porch. And do you know, sir, what's the meaning of that coat of arms there? It was the one with the three crowns, and though I'm not much of a herald, I was able to say that, yes, I thought it was the old arms of the kingdom of East Anglia. That's right, sir, he said, and do you know the meaning of them three crowns that's on it? I said no doubt it was known, but I couldn't recollect to have heard it myself, which is, I guess if you're one of these people that's insecure about not knowing things, I guess that's kind of a smooth cover. Well then, he said, for all you're a scholar, I can tell you something you don't know. <laughs> I like this old man. That's a, that's a funny backhanded sort of pleasantry there. <laughs> Them's the three holy crowns, but was buried in the ground near by the coast to keep them Germans from landing. Those Germans, you know. Ah, I can see you don't believe that, but I tell you, if it hadn't been for one of them, holy crowns being there still... Then Germans would have landed here time and again, they would, landed with their ships and killed man, woman, and child in their beds. Now then, that's the truth of what I'm telling you, that is, and if you don't believe me, you ask the rector. Here he comes. You asked him, I says. I mean, I guess especially after World War I, you'd be concerned about Germans in particular landing, but... I guess if you have magic crowns, then I, it's probably... Fa well, I don't know. It depends on how you want to count the Channel Islands in World War II. I looked round, and there was the rector, a nice-looking old man, coming up the path. And before I could begin assuring my old man, who was getting quite excited that I didn't disbelieve him, the rector struck in and said, What's all this about, John? Good day to you, sir. Have you been looking at our little church? So then there was a little talk which allowed the old man to calm down, and then the rector asked him again what was the matter. Oh, he said, it weren't nothing, only I was telling this gentleman he ought to ask you, ask you about them holy crowns. Ah, yes, to be sure, said the rector. That's a very curious matter, isn't it? But I don't know whether the gentleman is interested in our old stories, eh? Oh, he'll be interested fast enough, says the old man. He'll put his confidence in what you tells him, sir. Why, you known William Agar yourself, father and son, too. Then I put a word in to say how much I should like to hear all about it, and before many minutes, I was walking up the village street with the rector, who had one or two words to say to parishioners and then to the rectory, where he took me into his study. He had made out on the way that I really was capable of taking an intelligent interest in a piece of old folklore, and not quite the ordinary tripper. So he was very willing to talk, and it is rather surprising to me that the particular legend he told me has not made its way into print before. His account of it was this. There has always been a belief in these parts in these three holy crowns. The old people say they were buried in different places near the coast to keep off the Danes or the French or the Germans. So there, it's not just the Germans. We're threatened by all continental invaders. And they say that one of these three was dug up a long time ago, and another has disappeared by the encroaching of the sea and one still left doing its work, keeping off invaders. Well now, if you had read the ordinary guides and histories of this county, you will remember, perhaps, that in 1687 a crown, which was said to be the crown of Redwald, king of the East Angles, was dug up at Rendlesham, and alas, alas, 
melted down before it was even properly described or drawn. Well, Rendlesham isn't on the coast, but it isn't so very far inland, and it's on a very important line of access, and I believe that is the crown which the people mean when they say the one has, that has been dug up. Then to the south, you don't want me to tell you there was a Saxon royal palace which is now under the sea, eh? Well, there was the second crown, I take it, and beyond those two, they say, lies the third. So if your three magic crowns are protecting your, your coast and you negate the magic by like digging it up or destroying it, surely the one that's still there but like lost under the ocean still counts. Like that still works. It's not been dug up. Or I don't know, maybe that's not the parameters they're, they're using here. But in my mind, that one still counts. Do they say where, they, where it is? Of course, I asked. He said, yes, indeed they do, but they don't tell. And his, matter did not, his manner did not encourage me to put the obvious question. Instead of that, I waited a moment and said, what did the old man mean when he said you knew William Agar, as if that had something to do with the crowns? To be sure, he said, now that is another curious story. These Agars, it's a very old name in these parts, but I can't find that they were ever, ever people of quality or big owners. It's kind of like an unnecessary shot at a dead guy, I feel. These Agars say, or said, that their branch of the family were the guardians of the last crown. A certain old Nathaniel Agar was the first one I knew. I was born and brought up quite near here, and he, I believe, camped out at the place during the whole of the War of 1870. William, his son, did the same, I know, during the South African War. And young William, his son, who has only died fairly recently, took lodgings at the cottage nearest the spot, and I've no doubt it hastened his end, for he was a consumptive tuberculosis by exposure and night watching. And he was the last of that branch. It was a dreadful grief to him to think that he was the last, but he could do nothing. The only relations at all near to him were in the colonies. I wrote letters to, for him to them, imploring them to come home over uh, important family business, but there has been no answer. So the last of the holy crowns, if it's there, has no guardian now. That was what the rector told me, and you can fancy how interesting I found it. The only thing I could think of when I left him was how to hit upon the spot where the crown was supposed to be. I wish I'd left it alone. But there was a sort of fate in it, for as I bicycled back past the churchyard wall, my eye caught on a fairly new gravestone, and on it was the name of William Agar. Of course I got off and read it. It said, Of this parish, died at Seaburg, 19 blank, age 28. There it was, you see. A little judicious questioning in the right place, and I should at least find the cottage nearest the spot. Only I didn't quite know what was the right place to begin my questioning at. Again, there was fate. It took me to the curiosity shop down that way, you know. And I turned over some old books, and if you please, one was a prayer book of 1740-odd, and in rather handsome binding. I'll just go and get it. It's in my room. He left us in a state of some surprise, but we had hardly time to exchange any remarks when he was back, panting, and handed us the book open at the flyleaf, on which was written in a straggy hand, Nathaniel Agar is my name, and England is my nation. Seaburg is my dwelling place, and Christ is my salvation. When I am dead and in my grave, and all my bones are rotten, I hope the Lord will think on me when I am quite forgotten. That's quite an epitaph. I aspire to have a creepy epitaph on my tombstone. Somebody make a note of that. This poem was dated 1754, and there were many more entries of Agar's, Nathaniel, Frederick, William, and so on, ending with William 19 blank. You see, he said, anybody would call it the greatest bit of luck. I did, but I don't now. Of course, I asked the shopman about William Agar. And, of course, he happened to remember that he lodged in a cottage in the North Field and died there. This was just chalking the road for me. I knew which the cottage must be. There was only one sizable one about there. The next thing was to scrape some sort of acquaintance with the people, and I took a walk that way at once. A dog did the business for me. 
He made at me so fiercely that they had to run and beat him off, and then naturally begged my pardon, and we got into talk. I had only to bring up Agar's name, and pretend I knew, or thought I knew, something of him. And then the woman said how sad it was him dying so young, and she was sure it came of him spending the night out of doors in cold weather. Then I had to say, did he go out to sea at night? And she said, oh no, it was on the hillock yonder with the trees on it. And there I was. So the dog is going after you because the dog senses your shenanigans. Dogs know. Also, kind of a dick move to be like, I'm going to manipulate the local people into inadvertently giving up the location of a borderline supernatural sacred object for my own personal gain. Not a very nice thing to do. I know something about digging in these barrows. I've opened many of them in the down country, but that was with owner's leave and in broad daylight with men to help. I had to prospect very carefully here before I put a spade in. I couldn't trench across the mound, and with these old firs growing there, I knew there it would be awkward with the tree roots. Still, the soil was very light and sandy and easy, and there was a rabbit hole or so that might be developed into a sort of tunnel. Always uh, logically plan out when you're going to be looting the, lo the local archaeology. The going out and coming back at odd hours to the hotel was going to be the awkward part. When I made up my mind about the way to excavate, I told the people that I was called away for a night, and I spent it out there. I made my tunnel. I won't bore you with the details of how I supported it and filled it in when I'm done, but the main thing is that I got the crown. Naturally, we both broke out into ex exclamations of surprise and interest. I, for one, had long known about the finding of the crown at, Ren at Rendlesham and had, uh, and had often lamented its fate. I mean, I would too. That is kind of crappy when old archaeologically significant things are destroyed via ignorance. It's kind of kind of sad. No one has ever seen an ang Anglo-Saxon crown. At least no one had. But our man gazed at us with a rueful eye. Yes, he said, and the worst of it is, I don't know how to put it back. Put it back, we cried out. Why, my dear sir, you've made one of the most exciting finds ever heard of in this country. Of course, it ought to go to the jewel house at the tower. He's talking about the Tower of London where they keep all the crown jewels. What's your difficulty? If you're thinking about the owner of the land and treasure trove and all that, we can certainly help you through. Nobody's going to make a fuss about technicalities in a case of this kind. I'm not really sure I'd call trespassing, looting archaeological finds really technicalities. Like, we have laws about that kind of thing now. Probably more was said, but all he did was to put his face in his hands and mutter, I don't know how to put it back. At last, Long said, you'll forgive me, I hope, if I seem impertinent, but are you quite sure you've got it? I was wanting to ask much the same question myself, for, of course, the story did seem a lunatic's dream when one thought over it. But I hadn't quite dared to say what might hurt the poor young man's feelings. However, he took it quite calmly, really, with calm of despair, you might say. He sat up and said, Oh, yes, there's no doubt of that. I have it here in my room, locked up in my bag. You can come and look at it if you like. I won't offer to bring it here. We're not likely to let the chance slip. We went with him. His room was only a few doors off. The boots were just collecting shoes in the passage, so that might not make sense to you. Boots meaning the servants that clean and care for the footwear of the guests, not that somehow a boot has come to life and is collecting shoes. It's, it's a servant. They just call them boots when that's your job. Or so we thought. Afterwards, we were not sure. Our visitor, his name was Paxton, was in worse, a worse state of shivers than before and went hurriedly into the room and beckoned us after him, turned on the light and shut the door carefully. Then he unlocked his kit bag and produced a bundle of clean pocket handkerchiefs in which something was wrapped, laid it on the bed and undid it. I can now say I have seen an actual Anglo-Saxon crown. It was of silver, as the Rendlesham one is always said to have been. It was set with some gems, 
mostly antique intaglios and cameos, and was of rather plain, almost rough workmanship. In fact, it was like those you see on the coins and in the manuscript, which is sort of seems logical. I don't know why you would find that surprising. I found no reason to think it was later than the ninth century. I was intensely interested, of course, and I wanted to turn it over in my hands, but Paxton prevented me. Don't you touch it, he said. I'll do that. And with a sigh that was, I declare to you, dreadful to hear, he took it up and turned it about so that we could see every part of it. Seen enough, he said at last, and we nodded. He wrapped it up and locked it in his bag and looked, stood looking at us dumbly. Come back to our room, Long said, and tell us what the trouble is. He thanked us and said, Will you go first and see if, if the coast is clear? It wasn't very intelligible, for our proceedings hadn't been, after all, very suspicious, and the hotel, as I said, was practically empty. However, we were beginning to have inklings of... We didn't know what, and anyhow, nerves, nerves are infectious. So we did go, first peering out as we opened the door, and fancying, I found we both had the same fancy, that a shadow, or more than a shadow, but it made no sound, passed from us from one side, passed before us from one side to the other as we came out into the passage. It's all right, we whispered to Paxton, whispering seemed the proper tone, and we went with him between us back to our sitting room. I was preparing, when we got there, to be ecstatic about the unique interest of what we had seen, but then I looked at Paxton and saw that I would be terribly out of place, and I left it to him to begin. What is to be done? was his opening. Long thought it right, as he explained to me afterwards, to be obtuse and say, why not find out who the owner of the land is and inform, oh no, no, Packin broke in. Paxton broke in impatiently. I beg your pardon. You've been very kind, but it's got to go back, and I daren't be there at night, and daytime's impossible, and perhaps, perhaps though you don't see. Well, then, the truth is that I've never been alone since I touched it. I was beginning some fairly stupid comment, but Long caught my eye, and I stopped. Long said, I think I do see, perhaps, but wouldn't it be a relief to tell us more clearly what the situation is? Smooth, uh, smooth move from Paxton, or er, from Long there. <clears throat> then it all came out. Paxton looked over his shoulder and beck beckoned us to come nearer to him, and began speaking in a low voice. We listened most intently, and, of course, compared notes afterwards. I wrote down our version, so I'm confident I have what he told us, almost word for word. He said, it began when I was first prospecting, and put me off again and again. There was always somebody, a man, standing by one of the firs. This was in daylight, you know. He was never in front of me. I always saw him with the tail of my eye on the left or the right, and he was never there when I looked straight at him. Dude, that's a sign. Stop messing around. I would lie down for quite a long time and take careful observations and make sure there was no one. And then when I got up and began prospecting again, there he was. And he began to give me hints besides, for wherever I put that prayer book, short of locking it up, which I did at last, when I came back to my room, it was always out on my table, open at the fly leaf where the names were and one of my razors across it to keep it open. That's, yeah, that's ominous. That's threatening. Because in this time period, we're talking about like a full-on, like, straight razor, like a blade. That's a threat. That's not even a subtle threat. Leave it alone, bud. I'm sure he just can't open my bag, or something more would have happened. You see, he's light and weak, but all the same, I daren't face him. Well, then, when I was making the tunnel, of course it was worse. And if I hadn't been so keen, I should have dropped the whole thing and run. You probably should have, my man. There, there were signs. This was not the correct course of action. It was like someone scraping at my back the whole time. I thought for a long time it was only soil dropping on me, but as I got nearer the crown, it was unmistakable. And when I actually laid it bare and got my fingers into the ring of it and pulled it out, there came a sort of cry behind me. 
Oh, I can't tell you how desolate it was and horribly threatening, too. Yeah, it's the Elgin marbles all over again. Stop it. Don't do it. Put it back. It spoiled all my pleasure in my find. Cut it off at the moment. I think that was probably the point. And if I hadn't been the wretched fool I am, I should have put the thing back and left it, but I didn't. The rest of the time was just awful. I had hours to get through before I could decently come back to the hotel. First I spent time filling up my tunnel and covering my tracks. And all the while he was there trying to thwart me. Sometimes, you know, you see him and sometimes you don't, just as he pleases. I think he's there, but he has some power over your eyes. Well, I wasn't off the spot very long before sunrise, and then I had to get to the junction for Seaburg and take a train back. And though it was daylight fairly soon, I don't know if that made it much better. There were always hedges or gorse bushes or park fences along the road, some sort of cover, I mean, and I was never easy for a second. And then, when I began to meet people going to work, they always looked behind me very strangely. It might have been that they were just surprised at seeing anyone so early, but I don't think it was only that, and I don't know. They didn't look exactly at me. And then the porter at the train was like that, too. And the guard held the door open after I got into the carriage, just as he would if there was somebody else coming, you know. Oh, you may be very sure it isn't my fancy, he said with a dull sort of laugh. Then he went on, and even if I do get it to get to put it back, he won't forgive me. I can tell that, and it was I was so happy a fortnight ago. He dropped into a chair, and I believe began to cry. We didn't know what to say, but we felt we must come to the rescue somehow, and so, it really seemed the only thing, we said that if he was so set on putting the crown back in its place, we would help him. And I must say that after what we heard, it did seem the right thing. If these horrid consequences had come to this poor man, might there not really be something to the original idea of the crown having some curious power bound up with it to guard the coast? At least that was my feeling, and I think Long's too. Yeah, put the magic crown back, or the French will come for you. Our offer was very welcome to Paxton anyhow. When could we do it? It was nearing half past ten. Could we contrive to make it a late to make a late walk plausible to the hotel people that very night? We looked out of the window. There was a brilliant full moon, the Paschal moon. Long undertook to tackle the boots and pro propitiate him. He was to say that we should not be much over the hour, and if we did not, we did find it so pleasant that we stopped out a bit longer. We would see that he didn't lose by sitting up. Well, we were pretty regular customers of the hotel and did not give much trouble, and we were and were considering by the servants to be not under the mark in the way of tips, and so the bro the boots was propitiated and let us out to the seafront and remained, as we heard later, looking after us. Paxton had a large coat over his arm under which was wrapped the crown. So we were off on this strange errand before we had time to think how very much out of the way it was. I have told this part quite shortly on purpose, for it really does represent the haste with which we settled on our plan and took action. The shortest way is up the hill and through the churchyard, Paxton said, as we stood a moment before the hotel looking up and down the front. There was nobody at out, nobody at all. Seaburg was out, out of the season. Seaburg out of season was an early, quiet place. We can't go along the dike, the dike by the cottage because of the dog, Paxton also said, when I pointed to what I thought was a shorter way along the front and across two fields, because dogs know. Dogs know when you're up to stuff. The reason he gave was good enough. We went up the road to the church and turned in at the churchyard gate. I confess to having thought that there might be some, that there might be some lying there, who might be conscious of our business. Yeah, ghosts are going to watch you, because you kind of deserve it at this point. But if it was so, they were also conscious that one who was on their side, so to say, 
had us under surveillance and we saw no sign of them. Yeah, the ghosts in the graveyard aren't bothering with you because the ghost is already taking care of you. I mean, I guess once you accept the magic crown, that's actually flawless logic. But under observation, we felt we were, I mean, you clearly are, as I have never felt it at another time. Especially it was so when we passed out of the churchyard into a narrow path with close high hedges through which we hurried as Christian did through the valley and so got out into open fields. Then along hedges, though I would sooner have been in the open, where I could see if anybody was visible behind me, over a gate or two, then a swerve to the left, taking us up to the ridge which ended in that mound. As we neared it, Henry Long felt, and I felt too, that there, <clears throat> pardon me, that there were what I can only call dim presences waiting for us, as well as a far more actual one attending us. Of Paxton's agitation all this time, I can give you no adequate picture. He breathed like a hunted beast, and we could not either of us look at his face. How he would manage when we got to the very place, we had not troubled to think. He had seen so sure that it would not be difficult. Nor was it. I never saw anything like the dash with which he flung himself at a particular spot in the side of the mound and tore at it, so that in a very few minutes the greater part of his body was out of sight. We stood holding the coat and that bundle of handkerchiefs and looking very fearfully, I must admit, about us. There was nothing to be seen. A line of dark firs behind us made one skyline. More trees in the church tower a mile and a half off on the right. Cottages in a windmill on the horizon on the left, calm sea in front, faint barking of a dog at a cottage on a gleaming dike between us, full moon, full moon making the path we know across the sea, the eternal whisper of the Scotch firs just above us, and of, that, and of the sea in front. Yet in all this quiet and acute and acrid consciousness of a restrained hostility was very near us like a dog on a leash that might be let go any moment. Paxton pulled himself out of the hole and stretched a hand back to us. Give it to me, he whispered, unwrapped. We pulled off the handkerchiefs and he took the crown. The moonlight just fell on it as he snatched it. We had not ourselves touched that bit of metal, and I have thought since that it was just as well. In another moment, Paxton was out of the hole again and busy shoveling back the soil with his hands that were already bleeding. He would have none of our help, though. It was much the longest part of the job to get the place undisturbed, yet, I don't know how, he made a wonderful success of it. At last he was satisfied, and we turned back. We were a couple of, we were a couple of hundred yards from the hill when Long suddenly said to him, I say you've left your coat there. That won't do, see? And I certainly did see it, the long, dark overcoat laying where the tunnel had been. Paxton had not stopped, however. He only shook his head and held up the coat on his arms. And when we joined him, he said without any excitement, but as, but as if nothing mattered more, that wasn't my coat. And indeed, when we looked back again, the dark thing was not to be seen. Well, we got out onto the road and came rapidly back that way. It was well before twelve when we got in, trying to put a good face on it and saying, Long and I, what a lovely night for a walk it was. The boots was out on the lookout for us and made remarks like that, and we made marks like that for his edification as we entered the hotel. He gave another look up and down the seafront before he locked the front door and said, You didn't meet any people about, I suppose. Sir? No, indeed, not a soul. I said, at which I remember Paxton looking oddly at me. Only I thought I seen someone turn up the station road after you gentlemen, said the boots. Still, you was three together, and I don't suppose he meant mischief. I didn't know what to say. Long merely said good night, and we went off upstairs, promising to turn out all lights and to go to bed in a few minutes. Back in our room, we did our very best to make Paxton take a cheerful view. There's the crown back safe, we said. Very likely you'd have done better not to touch it, as he he heavily assented to. I mean, you probably would have done better, like, not to steal it in the first place. Don't be greedy. But no real harm has been done, and we shall never give this away to anyone who would be so mad as to go near it, 
Besides, don't you feel better yourself? I don't mind confessing, I said, that on the way there I was very much inclined to take your view about, well, about being followed, but going back it wasn't all at all the same thing, was it? No, it wouldn't do. You've nothing to trouble yourselves about, he said, but I'm not forgiven. I've got to pay for that miserable sacrilege still. I know what you're going to say. The church might help, yes, but it's the body that has to suffer. It's true. I'm not feeling that he's waiting outside for me just now, but... Then he stopped. Then he turned to thanking us, and we put him off as soon as we could. And naturally, we pressed him to use our sitting room the next day, and said we should be glad to go out with him. Or did he play golf, perhaps? Yes, he did, but he didn't think he should care about that tomorrow. Well, we recommended him to get up late and sit in our room in the morning while we were playing, and we would have a walk later that day. He was very submissive and piano about it all, ready to do just what we thought best, but clearly quite certain in his own mind that what was coming could not be averted or palliated. You'll wonder why we didn't insist on accompanying him to his home and seeing him off safe into the care of some brothers or something. The fact was he had nobody. He had a flat in town, but lately he had made up his mind to settle for a time in Sweden, and he had dismantled his flat and shipped off his belongings, and was whiling away a fortnight or three weeks before he made a start. Anyhow, we didn't see what we could do better than sleep on it, or not sleep, as was my case, and see what we felt like tomorrow morning. We felt very different, Long and I, on as beautiful an April morning as you could desire. And Paxton also looked very different when we saw him at breakfast. The first approach to a decent night I seem ever to have had, was what he said. But he was going to do as we settled, stay in probably all the morning, and come out with us later. We went to the links, where we met some other men and played with them in the morning, and had lunch there rather early, so as not to be late getting back. All the same... The snares of death overtook him. Whether it could have been prevented, I'm going to go with no, it could not have been prevented. You offended the ghost guardian guy. It's, that's it. That's, that's it. I don't know. I think he would have been got at somehow, do what we might. Anyhow, this is what happened. We went straight up to our room. Paxton was there, reading quite peaceably. Ready to come out shortly, said Long, say in a half hour's time. Certainly, he said, and I said we would change first and perhaps have baths, and call for him in a half an hour. I had my bath first, and went and lay down on my bed, and slept for about ten minutes. We came out of our rooms at the same time, and went together into the sitting room. Paxton wasn't there, only his book. Nor was he in his room, nor in the downstairs room. We shouted for him. A servant came out and said, why, well, I thought you gentlemen was gone out already, and so did the other gentleman. He heard you a-callin' from the path there, and run out in a hurry. And I looked out of the coffee-room window, but I didn't see you. However, he run off down the beach way. Without a word, we ran that way, too. It was the opposite direction of last night's expedition. It wasn't quite four o'clock, and the day was fair though not so fair as it had been, so there was really no reason, you'd say, for anxiety. With people about, surely a man couldn't come to much harm. But something in our look as we ran must have struck the servant, for she came out on the steps and pointed and said, Yes, that's the way he went. We ran on as far as the top of the shingle bank, and there pulled up. There was a choice of ways, past the houses on the seafront, or along the sand at the bottom of the beach, which, the tide being now out, was fairly broad. Or, of course, we might keep along the shingle between these two tracks and have some view of both of them, only that was heavy going. We chose the sand, for that was the loneliest, and someone might come to harm there without being seen from the public path. Long said he saw Paxton some distance ahead, running and waving his stick as though he wanted to signal to people who were on ahead of him. I couldn't be sure. One of those sea mists was coming up very quickly from the south. Here comes the creepy mist. That's bad news. There was someone, that's all I could say, and there were tracks on the sand, as of someone running who wore shoes. And there were other tracks made before those, for the shoes sometimes trod in them and interfered with them, of someone not in shoes. 
Oh, of course, it's only my word you've got to take for all this. Long's dead. We'd no time or means to make sketches or take casts, and the next tide washed everything away. All we could do was to notice these marks as we hurried on. But there they were, over and over again. And we had no doubt, whatever, that what we saw was the track of a bare foot, and one that showed more bones than flesh, which uh, cons consumptive people or people with tuberculosis at this time period often kind of like wasted away and were quite thin by the end. But I guess if you're a ghost, your foot can be whatever shape and manner of fleshiness appeals to you. The notion of Paxton running after after anything like this, and supposing it to be the friends he was looking for, was very dreadful to us. You can guess what we fancied, how the thing he was following might suddenly stop and turn round on him, and what sort of face it would show, half seen at first in the mist, which all the while was getting thicker and thicker. And as I ran on, wondering how the poor wretch could have been lured into mistaking that other thing for us, I remember his saying, he has some power over your eyes. And then I wondered what the end would be, for I had no hope now that the end could be inverted, and, well, there was no need to tell all the dismal and horrid thoughts that flitted through my head as we ran into the mist. It was uncanny, too, that the sun should still be bright in the sky, and we could see nothing. We could only tell that we were now past the houses and had reached the ga that gap there between them and the old Martello Tower. When you are past the tower, you know, there is nothing but shingle for a long way. Not a house, not a human creature. Just that spit of land, or rather shingle, with the river on your right and the sea on your left. But just before that, just by the Martello Tower, tower you remember that there is an old battery old, close to the sea, so some old fortifications. I believe there are only a few blocks of concrete left now. The rest has been washed away. But at this time there was a lot more, though the place was still a ruin. Well, when we got there, we clambered to the top as quick as we could to take breath and look over the shingle in front of it if by chance the mist would let us see anything. But a moment's rest we must have. We had run a mile at least. That is more miles than I have run in my adult life. Um, I guess I could be persuaded to run a mile if my friend was possibly in the midst of being murdered by a ghost, but it might depend on the friend. Like, there's definitely a hierarchy of who I would try and save from ghost murder. Nothing whatever was visible ahead of us, and we were just turning by common consent to get down and run hopelessly on, when we heard what I can only call a laugh, and if you can understand what I mean by a breathless, a lungless laugh, you have it, but I don't suppose you can. It came from below and swerved away into the mist. That was enough. We bent over the wall, and Paxton was there at the bottom. You don't need to be told that he was dead. His tracks showed that he had run along the side of the battery, had turned sharp round the corner of it, and, small doubt of it, must have dashed straight into the open arms of someone who was waiting there. His mouth was full of sand and stones, and his teeth and jaws were broken to bits. That is my personal nightmare. I only glanced once at his face. At that same moment, just as we were scrambling down from the battery to get to the body, we heard a shout and saw a man running down the bank of the Martello Tower. He was the caretaker stationed there, and his keen old eyes managed, had managed to descry through the mist that something was wrong. He had seen Paxton fall, and had seen us a moment after running up. Fortunate this for this, for otherwise we would hardly have escaped suspicion of being concerned in the dreadful business. It's always convenient to have a witness to make sure that you aren't taking the fall for ghost murder. Had he, we asked, caught sight of anybody attacking our friend? He could not be sure. We sent him off for help and stayed with the dead man till they came with the stretcher. It was then that we traced how he had come, on the narrow fringe of, of sand under the battery wall. The rest was shingle, and it was hopelessly impossible to tell whither the other had gone. What were we to say at the inquest? It was a duty, we felt, 
not to give up then and there the secret of the crown yeah that you don't the, the crown is bad news forget the crown the crown is not a thing anymore be quiet about it to be published in every paper I don't know how much you would have told, but what we did agree upon was this, to say that we had only made acquaintance with Paxton the day before, and that he told us that he was under apprehension of some danger at the hands of a man called William Agar. Also that we had seen some other tracks besides Paxton when we followed him along the beach. But of course, by that time, everything was gone from the sands. No one had any knowledge, fortunately fortunately, of any William Agar living in the district. I mean, yeah, the guy just died recently. The evidence of the man at the Martello Tower freed us from all suspicion. All that could be done was to return a verdict of willful, willful murder by some person or persons unknown. Paxton was so totally without connections that all inquiries that were subsequently made ended in a no thoroughfare. And I have never been at Seaburg or near it since and that is the end of a warning to the curious by m r james i got to say though i have never had a job that i that i felt oblig i would feel obligated to do even after i died i cannot think of a job that i could be persuaded to do after i died feel free to leave a comment what job would you continue to do even in death because I can't think of one. If, you'd enjoy, if you've enjoyed this reading, uh, feel free to give it a thumbs up. And you're free to comment. But Well, I mean, you're free to comment below generally anyway. But if you have a request for something you'd like me to read, please do let me know. Bye, everyone.